You're very welcome, everyone, uh, this evening to this event um, as part of the Humanitas Visiting Professorship Program involving Athol Fugard. Um, we have a discussion planned here this evening with Janet Suzman, the actress, John Carney, who has written with, worked with, collaborated with Athol, who is an actor and also a playwright, and then our visiting professor, Athol Fugard himself. What, what we were thinking of doing is making this fairly informal and relaxed, having some discussion here on stage amongst the three, and then opening up to you, the audience. But could I just say, first of all, on, on our joint behalves, a very, very warm welcome to Athol Fugard, to Janet Suzman, and also to John Carney. You're very, very welcome. as simply the moderator and to you know, keep the, the ball of commentary questions bouncing between, between our three guests. My name is Elika Burma and I'm here in the, in the English faculty. I'll hand over to you now with the opening question, perhaps to, to, to get us talking. Um, perhaps we can think back to how theatre was in the 60s, what the, what the theatre scene was, um, Athol, which, um, where you began and where John also began. And then Janet, as I understand, you left the country, um, born in Johannesburg, left the country to pursue your acting career in London. Could, could, you, could you take us back to the 60s and give, give us a, give yes, us a I, feel well, for that time? Uh, I'm going to bounce the ball in John's direction very quickly, <laughs> but there will be a, there's going to be a little preamble. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> John Carney and Winston and Chawner, uh, very young men, joined the Serpent Players group, which was then in, in existence, and um, participated in our early attempts at playmaking and things like that. And then at a certain point, the two of them came to me with the most lunatic request I had ever heard of, which was, well, suggestion that they wanted to be professional actors. Now, you know, the, you've got to understand that to be a professional black actor in South Africa at that point in time was like asking, I don't know, what was it like asking Janet? <laughs> a cow to jump over the moon. Yeah, uh, it was like asking the cow to jump over the moon. And I, 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 I tried to dissuade them, but they were very, very insistent. And, you know, they, they wanted to try to be actors, professional actors, earning a living. They both had jobs during the day. And um, anyway, I finally was persuaded by them to give it a go. And coming out of that, coming out of that, were the two plays called Sizwe Bonzi and The Island. Plays which uh, eventually ended up in the West End and on Broadway. But I would like to remind John, and maybe that will be the point in time for him, me to bounce the ball back to him, that his first ever performance of Sizwe Bonzi was in a garage for three domestic servants. Mm because we had no theatre to go to. We had nothing. We had no resources of any kind. What was it like, John? Well, uh, one of the three domestic workers walked out. <laughs> <laughs> Emily. Emily, Emily Dollary. Walker. Emily, Emily Dollary, who worked for the Dollary family because she said we were playing with something that was very hurtful to her. She had tried for years to bring her son to join her in Port Elizabeth. And because of the past laws, the Group Areas Act and uh, influx control, if you lived in Oxford and you want to go and work in London, it's impossible. You have to work as a black person in Oxford. If you fall in love with someone who lives in Birmingham, you've got to work this thing out because both of you are not allowed, I'm not allowed in Birmingham, she's not allowed in Oxford. 
So it was a deterrent even in falling in love. So the one lady walked out because she said we were playing with the truth. Now, just to, um, the history of this, this group is that they heard that Athol, who had been working in the 50s uh, in Johannesburg with, in Sophia Town with actors like Dan Bo, Mishak Messiah, Ken Gampu, Zakes Mukai, and they had been making and creating work where Athol wrote one, one of the great, I mean, the original plays in the township. I mean, before we even talked about township theater. And those were the Nongogo, uh, the No Good Friday, which uh, Sheila used to refer to them as, uh, as Athol's flops. <laughs> but Sheila's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so when Athol came to Port Elizabeth, this group of actors went to see him and uh, said, would you join the group and work with us? Now, when I came to the group, it was in 1965, they were doing a play called Antigone by some strange guy called Sophocles. <laughs> and I was in, this, in the movement. You know, at that time, it was the, the time people were being recruited to leave the country. So I walk in and uh, I had no communication with white people. White people were policemen not wearing uniform. Because <laughs> they were whites in uniform. When they were in plain clothes, they were, not, they were very sus were suspicious of them all the time. So Fetz Bukholan and Omshe introduced me and there was Arthur smoking the pipe. And he said, oh, sit down. <laughs> I mean, I thought, oh, he's not even saying, what's your name? He just sit down, take the script, read. And, and there was, I was looking at him thinking, here we go again. One of them white people that work with black people and they say, I know them. And I sat there listening to Athol talk about Antigone, Sophocles, the challenges. Was the state right to refuse Antigone to bury her brother, Polynices? Or was Antigone right to challenge and break the laws of the state and do what is right. It sort of set in the center of my political growth, being groomed within the struggle. So suddenly we're not talking about this play, which is Antigone, a Greek old play. We're talking about the state, about justice, about what is right, what is wrong, what is legal, what is illegal. I said, this white man's not bad. I think I like him. <laughs> And that was the beginning of that process, me working with Athol. We followed <coughs> that with the coat. But the I want to interrupt mm. you only because I've always wanted to know how you began to work on those themes, mm. the Sophocles and the prison, mm. and join them together into one of the great plays of the 20th century, the island. <laughs> I want to know the process, please, because I wasn't there. That <sighs> process started with one of serpent players how many serpent players ended up on Robben Island? Because the police were watching us at that point in mm. time. They came into rehearsals, they would try to intimidate, they took away the scripts, which is why for a long time there was absolutely no script of Cesare Bonzi in existence, because that way the police couldn't get hold of a document and ban it. For as long as it was in their two heads and in mine, mm. we were safe. So we, we had a lot of poetry in Russia survived that way, incidentally. But anyway, um, we, uh, we, uh, we lost players to Robben Island. And one of them was an actor who was going to play uh, Haman, who was going to play uh, Creon's son. And for him, the play was as passionate and real as a possibility to articulate what was in their hearts as it was for John. And on Robben Island, he refused to, he, his frustration with having lost the opportunity to do the play was so great that when the prison concert came around, he persuaded a fellow inmate in the cell with him to do a two man version of it lasting 10 minutes. Oh. Mm. And that was it. And that is how the island, in fact, ends for those of you who don't know the play. It's firstly what we learnt about the conditions in the Robben Island, the way the water street, the prisoners there. But at the end of it, there is the concert. And the concert is the 10-minute version of Robben Island that was staged uh, 
a, a ten minute version of Antigone, Antigone that was staged uh, in Robben Island. But in working on it, was it largely from improvisation that, for instance, you got that long mm -hmm. preamble to the play with the hard labour and stuff like that? Well, one of the things the prisoners uh, were forced to do, they were forced to take on complete, in an attempt to break their spirit. I mean, the whole system was geared at trying to break the spirit which, they, which the warders and the prison authorities and the police knew very well was still intact. That somehow nothing of what they had done to these people yet was enough to have broken that that sense of resistance they had to the system. And so they would literally get prisoners involved in absolutely pointless, pointless work. Push over that tree with your forehead. Mm. Empty the sea, dig a hole in the beach and empty the sea into it. And a whole day, for a whole day, a prisoner would have to go through that sh charade of work, mm. pretending to trying to do something that was absolutely impossible and absurd. But to squash that into a play is the genius of it. Well, the Broadway producers, when they first... Because John and Winston were extraordinary. They almost put the audience through the same experience because they took a long time to exchange loads of sand between two piles. I mean. My instruction was, listen, empty this pile of sand there, which happened to be Winston's pile. And I said to Winston, you empty your pile here. So the two actors were just all the time doing absolutely pointless thing. And we didn't do it just as an illustration of what the event was. This is the important thing. We made it an experience. Mm. We tried to make it an experience for the audience to watch Labour of monumental absurdity. When we began, <coughs> uh, we started at the back of the garage with bottles. That's right. the, there was a bottle of Cokes and many bottles that side, and many that side. Now, Winston is a wonderful human being, a brilliant actor, but a hell to live with. <laughs> so I take my pile and I put it there, and Winston takes the same pile and puts it there. So first we enjoyed it, it was fun. But we were always waiting for Arthur to say, that's enough now, go into the cell. And he's sitting there, he's saying nothing. <laughs> so we then, OK, we're going to do it fast. So the faster <laughs> I take my lot there, the faster he brings it back. And then one bottle breaks, and he's got a tiny cut on his hand, which was bleeding. You would imagine the blood was pouring out of his hand in liters. And he was swearing in course, and Arthur is not even looking at us. Up until the point we were so tired, and we said, if he doesn't say go to the cell, we're going in the cell now. And that's when Arthur said, OK, in the cell. <laughs> so that process, you know, of... Um, yeah. Because my uncle, uh, Harry, was on Robben Island. And he, he used to tell me a story of... Um, they would have these rocks on the wheelbarrow with the iron wheel. And they would move these rocks from there and drop them on the other side. But they would load the rocks so high on this thing that he was very short and very stouty. And every time he lifts the wheelbarrow, it falls on the side and the water says, yeah, Kani, you want to run a country. You can't run an F wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> so it, those were the things in our minds. But as soon as we got into the, the, the cell, then began the process. And I remember Arthur saying, uh, we had done Antigone before with George Mui, you know, the one you directed. Nom yes, in, yes. In, in, uh, before. So this time, Arthur forced us to remember that trial of Antigone without going to Antigone. We must remember and make it up, you know, and he's sitting there making those notes and talking to us. And we also remember that Shark never knew his lines. Shark, he never knew his lines. So I was quite amazed that if Shark is now on Robin Island doing a two-man performance of a digging, he never knew his lines. That's why, I t that's why when, when Shark was arrested, it was my first speaking part with the Serpent Players. You played Haymon, that's I right. I played Haymon. So, so this, this is the 60s, that you're improvising, that you're putting this play together. 
when does it go to Broadway? What, what, can you tell us about that process of it well, moving out firstly, from there? We have the, the huge debt of gratitude we have was to um, two people, Yvonne Bryceland, mm -hmm. who died dead now, unfortunately, a South African actress who I worked with for 20 odd years. Your uh, muse, one of your muses. Yes, one of my muses. That's right. Thank you, Janet. That's a, a, an extraordinary talent, a Stop lady enough. of courage, absolute courage. She would take a performance right to the edge. She would live as dangerously as she could on a stage for every second of it, of that, of that performance. But anyway, it was Yvonne Bryceland and her husband, Brian Asbury, started a little theatre and it was the first really significant attempt at an alternative theatre in South Africa. Uh, it, they gave it the name The Space. It was a little a loft space which they turned into a small intimate theatre. And at that point in time, a club theatre, as was the case in, 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 in London with the, when the Lord Chamberlain was still crossing out bad, rude words in scripts and all of that. The, the way the arts theatre used to work, somewhere near Covent Garden. Where was the arts theatre? Can anybody remember? The old still, arts theatre? Well, anyway. Still there. Huh? Come back again. Banton Street. Was it? Mm. Yes, yeah, something like that. But anyway, in South Africa, by virtue of being a club theatre, we could have mixed audiences. Mm. And we could have mixed casts. Because then already the group areas acts and various pieces of legislation were in place which prohibited uh, um, a, a mixing of audiences and actors on a stage, among other things. I mean, I, there was one critical moment in the history of, of Serpent Players when we were invited by an amateur drama group to show our work to the... Uh, were you with the group? Yes, yes you were yes, with yes, the group. Yeah. And they, they wanted us to come and present because they'd heard about our activity. We'd already had a little following in the townships. And they wrote and said, but there's one condition. Please come. And without saying it as quite as crudely as that, they said, would you see to it that everybody has a pee before, relieves themselves before they come because they can't use our toilets. When this condition was spelt out to the f group, Oh, it was an extraordinary moment. It was a really extraordinary moment. We finally, finally, had decided to accept the invitation. And what did we do, John? Can you remember the coat? Yes. We were doing the coat. We did and, the coat. Yeah, and Arthur told us the conditions that we um, are not allowed to use the toilet facilities. We're not allowed to use the ante rooms, which were the dressing rooms. We cannot enter the down hall in the main entrance, which other white persons would use. We would come in on the good side. And there will be no communication between us while performing this thing with the audience before and after. And the last one was because there was a white by night law. After nine o'clock, a black person cannot be in the white Port Elizabeth city without a permit written by the master or the madam saying that this is why you are this late, otherwise you'll be arrested under white by night. So at the end of the performance, it said it does not exempt them from the white, the, the, the white by night law. So Arthur says, so what do we do, guys? And we thought, what's, what's wrong with him? We can't perform under those conditions. We are not going to do this. This is an insult, and we're all militant. And we all said, no. And then Arthur said, guys, this is an opportunity. We've been playing to people who believe and are supportive of us, black like universities and nice white liberal audiences. This is an ordinary audience. It's the theater appreciating audience. <coughs> so I will read on your behalf. So we all left, very angry. So I was at home, and I thought, this is an opportunity. I'll go and read with Athol. So I get in the bus, <laughs> and I arrive at the terminus, and I see Mulligan. He had also decided on his own that he will read with Athol. By the time we got to this hall, we were all there. <laughs> and we, all of us had made a, a decision to go there. 
It was an mm -hmm. unbelievable yeah, experience. Yeah. 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 And then the transition to America, to Broadway? Oh, they, well, mm. then, so in the space theatre, they gave us a chance to present our plays. Mm. And I can still remember the occasion on Robert Island when we climbed onto a table and looked through a little fan light and we could see the island in the distance. And it was like a blessing on the, on the performance. Mm -hmm. At that moment, they were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a special branch in that audience. They mm -hmm. asked if they could come and watch. Mm -hmm. where they had to get permission from us, of course. Mm -hmm. But they came, they watched. And um, so from there, it, where did we go from there? I think it was to the Royal Court Theatre in London. Nicholas Wright. Yes, Nicholas, Nicholas Wright, Wright and Oscar Lewinstein yeah, yeah. gave us a chance to present our plays at the Royal Court Theatre Theater in London. And this was joined by another sort of semi-improvised work that I had created with uh, Yvonne Bryceland called Statements After an Arrest Under the Immorality Act. Uh, on, Yvonne and myself acted in that, but for the arts, for Royal, Royal Court season, uh, ben, Kingsley ben Kingsley played the role. Mm -hmm. And then from the Royal Court, it went to the ambassadors on the West, West End. End. And um, and then to Broadway, which ended with John and Winston receiving Tonys for their performances. Fantastic. And, and what year was that? Was it Seven, we won the Tony 74, 75 season. 70, 74, mm. 75. Yeah. And Janet, where, where, where did you come in, in, into this, um, as it were, the, the, the Fugard moment? Did, did you have a sense of, of Athol's work at that point in time? I, I did. Having come here, to get the hell out, mm. which was basically what everybody... Well, I was at Wits University, so I was doomed with a sort of semi-education. Um, and it was the fashion then for everybody to just to get out. And there, were, there was a tremendous amount of arrests and trouble and police on the campus, and because yeah. those were the years they brought in something called... We called it um, the Academic Apartheid Bill but they called it the Extension of University Education Act. <laughs> <laughs> and we did, I don't remember going to lectures at all. We just were on the lawn outside the library in the Great Hall constantly every day with a police presence st strongly on campus, um, boycotting and protesting. Um, nobody wanted this bill to go through, but of course it did. But um, so it was a very troubled time. And I remember putting down my pen with sweaty palms because in South Africa, they do things at the proper end of the year. You write your exams at the end of the year, December. It's That's hot. That's right. Right? Hot. And um, I put down my pen and had wangled myself onto an arts uh, faculty tour. And we flew from Johannesburg to Athens. I will never forget this, to a crystalline day where I could see Sophocles writing his plays. <laughs> <laughs> and from thence, I was introduced to, um, to Europe and I just didn't come back because I decided that um, I must pursue this acting thing. It intrigued me. But I have a very clear memory of driving from the centre of Port Elizabeth to our little house down at Schoenmarker's Scorp with you and me, Barney. Me, right. And I met him first there. There <laughs> was a, a bit of a drinking party going on, I remember. You that oh, oh, yes. do, do tell, do, do fill well, us in on that story. Well, I met this young man, and I was, we were both quite young men. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and we had the most terrible fight, didn't we? <laughs> and it was about language. And I remember John shouting at me, saying, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't even speak my effing language. And I said, well, you're the winner, because you can speak mine. <laughs> so, so, and it's true. But I said, nobody taught us this language. I mean, but because um, there was definitely a spark there, I have loved him since then. <laughs> Enormously. Now, the, the problem with Janet, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what she didn't know is that although we were artists working and being mentored by Arthur. When we went back to the township, 
we became, we were part of the movement, the underground. So we're very politicized. And um, I remember one time I was so angry at something. And then Arthur said to me, you're very angry. Listen, I can't make a bomb. Therefore, I can't teach you how to make a bomb. I can only teach you to write and act. But anyway, if you ever learn to make that bomb, you are so tight. When you put the fuse, you will blow yourself. <laughs> so, so there goes, we're sitting there, and Janet is talking about that. I said something in Tulsa to Winston or somebody on my right, and she said I was rude to speak that language when we know they don't. Wow, my God, I said, for 300 F years, you have been rude to me, and I made it a huge people political statement, she didn't give an inch. She screamed back and I shouted back and Arthur was laughing. <laughs> and, in <the> end, <laughs> and in the end, we were tired of screaming at each other. And then we looked at each other and I said, all right then, what is it you want to say? Do you want to know what I said to Winston? We're saying we like you. <laughs> <laughs> and thus began a relationship, you know. And, because the, uh, Athol was the real first white person I've ever had a relationship with on the context of not in the post office or police station or whatever, insurance salesman. So my first real, real contact with someone on the other side was Athol. Later in my life, I said he messed up my revolution <laughs> because I found that there were good white people no. who were committed to the struggle and for mm -hmm. decency in just human beings. So what's gonna happen when that time comes, I can't kill him? What if there's more people that, look, that are like him? This then began to create a problem in my revolution. <laughs> Speaking of revolution and thinking of states of emergency, can we move forward a little bit to, to when things get really, really difficult and very, very divided? around the late 70s, Soweto, and then into the 80s in the states of emergency. Um, Janet? No, because I wasn't there. I came back at the end of the 80s with this Othello <laughs> idea. Um, could, 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 could we talk about but that? But maybe John should talk about that interim. Mm, the interim, the, the interregnum. The, these were the, the 70s were very difficult because we would go to Arthur's place and then Arthur would take us back at the end of each session. Remember when we were stopped near the entrance in New Brighton, yeah. Arthur? Uh, yeah. And then the police stopped us and we all got out. Nomshe Konyeni, one of the actresses, was sitting in front and we were all sitting at the back in Arthur's car. You could only go to the border where the township begins or the industrial area. And the policeman asked Arthur, does your wife know this Kafir bitch is sitting in the front seat? <laughs> and, uh, and Arthur said, of course, then I don't know. Sheila wouldn't mind. He says, that's what, what we're asking, whether she would mind or not. <laughs> does she know? <laughs> and then uh, those were the days, and so it was very difficult. And Arthur also was constantly being raided at home, house and all the thing. And when we met at Arthur's place, we could see the security branch walking up and down. It's this very small street school microscope, that area where we stayed. So people knew each other. So if there's any one black person, even a white person walking up and down, we already knew that person did not belong there. And most of the plays we did, we did the, the, the Bakai by Euripides, mm. and we did all these Greek mm. plays and just in the township, Le Juste by Albert Camus, and when we would be picked up. And the, the thing that was very difficult was how the security tried to plant and sow uh, disinformation amongst ourselves, mm. the mistrust. And those were the days of high, the only way the white minority government could succeed was in, they had an incredible, impenetrable network of informers within the black township. So if you want to destroy someone, his life almost to that person to be killed, you only have to accuse them of being an informer. And when we performed our little plays, the trials of Brother Jero in Coston, and with those plays, the, the police would come. Remember when we took Athol to the township with his woolen hat? In, and we were performing Caesar Banzi for the first time at the St. Stephen's Church Hall. 
Well, that was, that was a never-to-be-forgotten experience. I mean, I don't know if there's ever been theatre as such as we experienced that evening. The play had already... Which play was it? Excuse me, Bonzi is Dead. Mm. Yeah. And the play had already reached, gone overseas. And so the news had come back that this play was a huge success. And for the first time in New Brighton, New Brighton was going to be given a chance to see this play. I mean, that title, as far as a New Brighton audience is concerned, you know, is, is enough. And the people started coming, and the police started coming as well, of course. But by at least 10, 15 minutes before we were due to start our performance, and facilities were very primitive. I mean, I switched the lights on and I switched the lights off, and that was our <laughs> lighting effect, but lighting design. But the point was that they were jam-packed already in the hall, so people started to sit in the fan lights up on the side of the walls. Mm. It, was, it was extraordinary. And then the performance began. And at a certain moment, in, and the audience knew that the police were outside. So there was already a fissure of, uh, of panic and terror at what was going to possibly happen that evening. And when John, in the course of the play, persuades or tries to persuade Wolf, uh, Winston, Winston to change these identity in terms of the passbook, that a hated symbol of the apartheid laws, People in the audience thought, this is when, excuse the expression, but there's no other one that does justice to it, the shit hits the fan. And they stood up and made for the exits. <laughs> and stopped for one last look at the stage, and John and Winston just carried on, and slowly they came back to their seats. And then the debate started between, firstly, in terms of this issue, do you sacrifice your identity so that your wife can come and be with you in the town, so that your children can come and be with you in the town, so that you can find a job that mm. will earn enough money to feed the them and clothe them mm. in the town, because that was the issue involved in losing your identity. identity. If you jettisoned the name of and became the dead man, Robert Zwellen Zima, good things were going to happen. And as the debate between John and Winston developed on stage, people in the audience started contributing to the debate. <laughs> and at some point, the situation was so rowdy that a gentleman jumped up onto the stage and said, listen, this meeting is getting out of hand. <laughs> and, and he literally then ran an impromptu Meeting. <laughs> he did what Elka is trying to do tonight with three very really people. You know, he, he, uh, he ran a meeting and people got the chance to say who they agreed with and who they disagreed with and get it out of them. And um, when it, everybody had had a chance, who wanted to speak, had spoken, he said, right, back to you, John and Winston, finish the play. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was oh. an unbelievable experience. I sat there. Maybe that's how theatre ought to be. Well, yeah, that is yeah. exactly right. Yeah. That is exactly right. That is what our Bertie Brecht tried to mm. do with his theatre, you know, Brecht, yeah. or yeah, what yeah. he preached that theatre should be. Mm. Uh, I, I, it was an extraordinary involvement in a community mm. in terms of a document, a piece of paper that we had all contributed to, contributed to anyway. So, there we are. So, so the, the, the theatre kept the, st the spark going between the two of you and the other actors in, in that very difficult situation of the 1980s. Yeah. But, but perhaps you guys ought to talk about why the market theatre happened then in the mid-70s. Exactly, yeah. Huh? Could... Well, that was Barney Simon and... Manny Manny. And yeah. And they started because... They wanted it... another space in Joburg. Mm. Yes, I know. They right. had both, uh, you know, worked in theatre, but they... It was Yvonne Bryceland and Brian Asprey's effort in Cape Town that spurred them on That's right. mm -hmm. to find a venue, which is the extraordinary market theatre that exists today, uh, and to start work there. And that is where John and I then because went on to do a lot of work. And we opened, didn't we open with 
Death of Bessie, Bessie no, I can't we, say we, it. We the death with, of Bessie Smith. We opened with <laughs> Marat Saat. The, the market opened with Marat Saat. Oh, Remember right. we went our way to Australia with Sandra Prince or Janice Hanneman. We were watching Marat Saat. And I was sitting there thinking, right. what the hell is this play about? <laughs> But there was a moment when Sandra Blinzo comes to the front of the stage and says, what kind of people are these? In that madness in that place. Then, of course, Barney came to Port Elizabeth. And you know, Barney was very mischievous. We used to order structure, commitment. When you work with Athol, it's a dangerous situation. And Barney was playful. And we thought, come on, guy, what's this? Guy, he's a Jewish guy, what's wrong with us? Look, we got work to do, and Barney would play around because we used to work in a disciplined fashion. Then later, 1977, Barney wanted to do the death of Bessie Smith. And then <laughs> Janet and I got together again with Winston, and that was an experience. <laughs> How the audience is also like at the market watching a mixed cast. Yes. Also watching this conflict and confrontation between us and also Barney's notes. <laughs> Barney's notes. <isn't laughs> it? Danny once, Barney once said to Janet, you know, Janet, uh, that's it. And Janet looked at Barney and went back and then we did a scene again. And Barney said, no, no, Janet, I feel... Um, uh, feel like you've just swallowed the whole world and Jesus, she exploded. <laughs> <laughs> but only what the F do you want to say? Do you, you can't even give a bloody note? What is it you want me to do? <laughs> and Bunny said, that. <laughs> 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 that. It was, those were like, the market theater was there and when the security came and they looked at the theater and they asked Manny and Bunny to apply for what was now becoming to be called an international license. Now the international license measures the aisles. The aisle must be about one and a half meters wide so that a black person and a white person can go in up down the aisle without touching. I didn't know that. Yes, that's international license. I never heard. And then there is the seating. We had to lose a seat. So if I'm sitting here, we, the elbows mustn't touch. I didn't know. Yes, that's international license. So you could lose this seat and lose that seat. But then Raymond Tucker said, nah, don't apply for it. He's a lawyer. He, said, he was our lawyer trustee. And he found a piece of paper in 1937 when the building was opened. It was an f Indian fruit and vegetable market. Mm. But the, the stallholders were white. They brought the produce. There was also pheasants from Newcastle, which came in with Newcastle sickle disease, which then they were, they were uh, outlawed. So, but colored and black and Asian uh, stallholders could come into the building and buy the produce to sell in the black community. Therefore, there was a special permit for black stallholders to come into the building and buy the produce from white farmers to sell it in the black community. They could not stop the market operating because of that law. Now, when the audience finished seeing a play, there was a bar. The law forbade black people to drink with white people in the bar. We get a bit randy when we've had a lot to drink. <laughs> so um, Graham Lindop came with a wonderful idea. There was one of the trustees who was called Andrews, Andrews um, Stewart, Andrews McLean, he bought the bar for one rand and called it Andrews Bar, which meant the bar was private. And the invitation to the bar was the ticket, the half stub of the ticket. So if you had seen the play, mm -hmm. you can go to the bar. So we, we, that's the only way we sort of went around the law so we could also have a drink. So those were the, mm. the state of emergency became so harsh. This is the, the theatre of the absurd. The, the, yes, the, certainly. The theatre yeah. of the, those days was so harsh because the, the government was determined to obliterate any form of resistance. 
The Bikos in 1977 dying, the Timors dying, the young people being arrested, people leaving the country, and the country really, really, there was a point where we all felt it's a lost cause. Mm. Mm. But it was only the artists and the people in the theatre who felt we got to keep that flickering mm. flame yeah. of hope going on. Yeah. And one of the things I will never forget in my 16, seven years of life is what I got as a gift from Arthur. Three words, the truth, trust, hope. And he said, if you just could hold on in those three words, and that has been for me the mandate in everything I do, in every, even in my existence, those three little words that you gave me as a gift, truth, hope, and trust. And every time we would improvise or work on something, and you said hope, and Arthur would say, that's a big word. <laughs> that's a big word. And first it was some nice thing to say, mm. trust, that's a big word. But as I grew older and I realized the only way we managed to continue the resistance in South Africa, to continue that rise against apartheid was those three words, because without it, we were killing each other. Mm -hmm. Speaking of hope and trust, shall we talk a bit, Janet, for a moment about the Othello production and, and how that was, bringing yes. that to, to the market theatre? I, I wasn't one of those expatriates that abandoned my motherland, ever. I always was drawn and drawn and drawn and drawn back to it. And I used to go back every single year, really, after drama school, having joined the Royal Shakespeare Company. And what I was learning here in England was something that was still, I think, a sort of miracle, which was to learn to get to grips with this very great language. And it was because I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company at the time, it was really flourishing in its first great season with the uh, Wars of the Roses with Peter Hall and Peter Brook, that extraordinary history cycle. A state of the nation examination of England, really, at the beginning of the 60s, uh, which eventually grew to these seven history plays, Richard II to Richard III. So you could see a different history play every single night of the week at Stratford. That was my induction into Shakespeare. And I can't tell you, and John Barton, of course, the great John Barton. I can't tell you how much I learnt. And it was that, I suppose, that um, many years later I was able to draw upon mm. when I went back one April day to Johannesburg and I saw John in a play at the market. I always, always went back to the market. Um, because I felt home was there in a way because of my relationship with Barney Simon and him and other actors there. And I saw John in a play and I thought, God, you deserve something better than this. And uh, nestling flew through my ear and stayed in my brain. And it was called Othello. It just stayed there and fluttered around like a little bird in a nest. And I couldn't get rid of this susurration in my brain. And I went home that night and I found on my mother's bookshelf a folio version of Othello, you know, with all those Fs. <laughs> really difficult to read, actually. And I read through Othello in Act 3, Scene 3, I found the speech I wanted, which I still call the apartheid speech. It's where Iago whispers into his ear um, that enormous speech about um, the unnaturalness of mixing out of your own clime, complexion and degree, wherein we see in all things nature tends. We may smell in such a will most rank, foul, disproportion, thoughts unnatural. Well, that was grand apartheid. Mm. The whole idea that it was unnatural for races to mix and therefore they must be kept apart. And there it was as if Shakespeare was prefiguring in the whole first third of that play, he talks about the unnaturalness of breaking what, is true, what, what, what people see as being true to nature. So I knew this was the play we had to do. Here was Shakespeare, the protest playwright. And if you look at the, <laughs> the, 
The plot of Othello, it's quite simple. A black man is humiliated by a white thug. That's it. That's Othello. And so I went the very next morning to the market and I found John and I said, we have to talk because we've got to do this play. The only thing you have to be strong about is I want to direct it. So <laughs> I felt him lurch slightly, but he was too much of a gentleman to actually faint. Um, and then we embarked on this invent adventure together. The point that we had to convince, we wanted very much to do this in the proper way. And, and therefore we had to, I had to find permission from the ANC in exile, from the culture desk, mm. um, uh, that we had to convince them that this dead white European male was actually a protest playwright, because that's how we needed to see him. Um, and eventually we were persuasive enough for them to say, go ahead. The interesting thing was on the other side, these Calvinist policemen did not have under any subclause Shakespeare as a protest playwright. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare was kind of, you know, godlike. So they could not come in and disrupt us doing a Shakespeare play. So there was a kind of strange standoff, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. They didn't actually break the doors down. Um, but we were very... To do an, an incendiary sort of a play, which because it has at its core a very sexual element, it's about sexual jealousy. Um, and I think probably before Hollywood, we had a black man and a white woman embracing on, on stage in public in Johannesburg. Um, I, don't th I, I can't think of a single film out of Hollywood that, that, uh, where that happened. You can imagine the heat, really, in the building, the seat slamming up and the doors opening as people in dudgeon left. But just to bring up this thing about the audience vociferation, it was a huge lesson to me because whereas in Europe, if you say to an actor, you could have heard a pin drop. That silence is the greatest accolade an actor can expect mm. on a European stage. In Africa, it's the reverse. Mm. It's really spooky. Mm. That kind of silence is like something's wrong. Something's like, wrong. Something's Definitely. wrong. <laughs> something's Nobody wrong. does silence like this. It's not right. It's like the lights have been fused or something. Mm. And so at high moments of the tragedy, there is noise from the audience, not silence. And this turns everything inside out because you realize that untutored audiences, audiences who have not been told you must behave in a theater, behave very spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, the only place you will see that in England or Britain today is at a pantomime, mm -hmm. where people say, look out behind you and stuff like that. You know, because it's like part of the game. Mm -hmm. And that used to happen in, in the run of Othello. Mm -hmm. Uh, people couldn't bear it when Iago took his knife out and stabbed Amelia in the last act, mm. and stuff like that. The danger of the thing becomes very expressive. Mm. It's coming up to the time where we'd like to, I think, um, move out um, to the audience and, and <coughs> open for questions. But, but just before we do that, and thinking of turning things inside out, I mean, you've talked, all three of you, very, very compellingly about the kind of the, the energy that came from resistance, the, you know, the, the, the danger that came from the drama. What did 1994 bring? To, to all three of you, really, in, 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 in terms of your dramatic practice, in terms of the theatre. It, you know, it, it was a marvellous release and an important moment of freedom. How did that, has, how has that impacted on your work? Actually, it started in 1990, because uh, suddenly, as you were watching on television, Mandela being released, that release was kept so secret that even the people within the movement and the structures did not talk about it or did not know. So I always say that there were almost 300 protest plays written in January demanding the release of Nelson Mandela. So when he walked out, they had to go to the shredder. <laughs> the ideas we were writing and creating work as protest against the apartheid state 
suddenly became irrelevant. The critics, I always say, went to the funeral of protest theater and we were not invited. And people began to say, that's over, protest is over, now Mandela's president, now you should write about the present, the rainbow nation, now work must be progressive. People with resources brought in all the old plays that they couldn't bring because of the cultural boycott. They brought in even Tom Jones, Michael Jackson in the music and everybody. And we as creative writers and writers who were groomed in the struggle, we found like in a space where we didn't know what do we do. I remember the market I proposed we do the odd couple, you know, but just trying to find something that would bridge the gap of nothing happening. And many people, including white people, just walked out. And they said, I don't come to the market theatre to see something I can see on Broadway done much better or in the West End. I brought my friend because I told them this theatre is about South African work, the South African struggle. So we were really for quite a, to 90, 93, 94, 95, wobbling mm -hmm. quite a lot, mm -hmm. not knowing actually what statement to make. And slowly we did settle down. Mm. I mean, and um, <clears throat> when the first kind of play that approached the issue of confronting forgiveness is when Athol wrote Playland. Mm. And uh, Sean Taylor and I did this play, I remember, which was uh, about this white young boy from the army, we call him Boss Befock, traumatized by the war. He's trying to find someone he could talk to and ask for forgiveness for what they did during the war. And as we came out of the theater with Sean, we went to the bar. And there was some black people waiting in the bar. And they said to Sean, uh, did you mean it? And Sean said, what? He said, when you said to him, I'm sorry, did you mean it? And Sean, but it's a play, I'm an actor. <laughs> and I looked at their faces. They were so disappointed at the fact that he mm. didn't say he meant it, mm. you know? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but the, the, the writer meant it, so it's okay if you don't mean it, mm. you're just an actor. And remember again when Tony Sher and Greg Doran did mm. Titus and Andronicus mm -hmm. and a production at the Market Theatre. There's a group of miners who, from Caltonville who have a manager who's very cultural inclined. He would take these 20 or 30 miners for a walk in Johannesburg and they would shop and do things, but in the evening they'll come and see a play. They'd seen My Children, My Africa, they'd seen Master Harold and the Boys, they'd seen Miss Julie, Miss Othello, they'd seen all those great plays, Waza Albert, things that make him. So when they saw Titus and Andronicus, they said they're very quiet watching this play. And I joined them at the bar, and they said, I said to them, what did you think of the play? And one of them says, he's a very good writer. Has he written any other plays? <laughs> <laughs> but then the question was, why did the actors pretend we were not here? I said, what do you mean? said, they never looked at us once. That's the only thing we didn't like about it, was that the actors pretended we were not here. But it was interesting, we were chatting in the car about this very thing, that Titus Andronicus in Johannesburg at that moment, it's a play about justice being buried, isn't it? Mm. It's a play about moral chaos. And we'd just become a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> and so this play was so unsuitable. And everybody sat there going, and no, we want to celebrate. But then it came here, and of course, everything changes where... The sense of place, I'm with Peter Brook and all of us on this, the place you do a play is just so important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where it speaks to the audience mm -hmm. that it's speaking to. And there, it spoke depression and misapprehension somehow. Here, it seemed to be speaking about South Africa. Mm. And it was, um, I think, very well received. Mm, very. Um, so I think that the place, the place you do something resonates, makes the play resonate, just as the oppression in South Africa made Othello resonate with a completely different bell tone than you, when you see it here. Mm. Mm. And I think that's terribly important, like that night you were talking about. Like, mm -hmm. You must talk, mm -hmm. you must talk, man. Mm. No, 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 I, th I think you've, you chaps have said it for me as well. No.